Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Christian, and I'm, it's, I'm have the honor of serving as president of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation. And on behalf of Foundation Chairman Larry Temple and our entire board, it's really my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. We're in for such a treat for this year's Harry Middleton Lecture. The annual Harry Middleton Lecture was established by Lady Bird Johnson in 1994, and no one could be more deserving of this honor. Harry Middleton has been part of the LBJ world and the LBJ extended family for many decades. He served as a speechwriter in the White House from 1967 to 69, and he returned to Austin at the end of the LBJ presidency and helped President Johnson write the vantage point. You might have heard rumors that President Johnson liked to have things under control. <laughs> this library benefited hugely from the President's attention to detail, and one of those details was that LBJ wanted a superb director, someone he could trust implicitly. So in 1971, Harry was named director of the LBJ Library by President Johnson himself. Harry served here for 32 remarkable years and certainly met and exceeded every expectation both President Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson had of him. Please help me thank Harry Middleton for his service, loyalty, and leadership. While Lyndon Johnson recognized and rewarded Harry's excellence, so did other former presidents. Gerald Ford, who was a Harry Middleton lecturer in 1997, called Harry the Dean of the Presidential Library Directors. Other Harry Middleton lecturers have included Jimmy Carter, Mikhail Gorbachev, Sandra Day O'Connor, journalists Tom Brokaw and Brian Williams, and playwright David Mamet. Tonight, we continue this tradition with best-selling author Jody Picot, who will talk about her latest book, The Storyteller, with LBJ Library's current director, Mark Updegrove. Please join me, in welcome, join me in welcoming Mark, who will introduce Ms. Picot for a reading. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good evening. I just told our, our guest of honor about the three previous Harry Middleton lectures. I said, you know, I mentioned that you're, you are following a very hallowed tradition here. And the last three speakers have been Mikhail Gorbachev, Jimmy Carter, and Sandra Day O'Connor. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, oh, no pressure. <laughs> but there's a very good reason that we have Jody as this year's Harry Middleton Lecture, and that is because of Harry Middleton. Harry Middleton made it abundantly clear that he wanted a writer for his next lecture, and boy, did we ever get a writer in Jody Picot. As you were walking to the auditorium tonight, you saw the covers of all 18 works of fiction that have sprung from the pen of Jody Picot. It's a remarkable body of work that includes New York Times bestsellers, such as My Sister's Keeper, Vanishing Acts, The Tenth Circle, 19 Minutes, Change of Heart, Handle with Care, House Rules, Sing You Home, Lone Wolf, and her current, The Storyteller. Now, I'm exhausted just giving you that list of names. Imagine how exhausting it is to be as prolific an author as Jody. As if that weren't enough, she's also the co-author of a musical play for teens with her son Jake called Over the Moon and co-author of a novel for teens with her daughter, Samantha, called Between the Lines, which is another New York Times bestseller. Jody is a native of Long Island, New York, a graduate of Princeton University, and a current resident of Hanover, New Hampshire. And before I bring her out, I'm going to mention to our guys back in the booth that we're calling a bit of an audible here. And rather than retire immediately to these chairs to have a conversation, Jody is going to do a reading from the storyteller from this podium. So if you could keep the lights up for a minute, that'd be great, and then we'll go to the, the chairs. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jody Paco. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me here tonight. In case there's any question, I am not Sandra Day O'Connor. 
Um, before I do a reading, I'm going to set up for you what the storyteller is about, because the section I'm going to be reading is actually smack in the middle of the book. The storyteller is the story of Sage Singer. She is a 23-year-old baker in a small New Hampshire town who's a bit of a recluse. She has a scar on her face, she doesn't get along with people, and she's attending a grief group because her mother recently passed away. At this grief group, she meets a very unlikely friend, 95-year-old Joseph Weber. Everybody knows Joseph and loves him. He is everyone's favorite adoptive grandpa. He's a retired teacher. He coaches Little League. He leads the 4th of July parade. And he asks Sage for a favor. He would like her to help him die. Not because he's ill, but quite the contrary. He thinks that the reason he has lived this long is God's little joke on him, because he used to be a Nazi. What he doesn't know is that Sage's grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. So if she helps him, is it mercy, is it justice, or is it revenge? The section I'm going to be reading to you from, as I said, is in the middle of the book, and it's an extended narrative by Minka, who is Sage's grandmother. Um, this is Minka when she is a teenager, and in the section I'm going to be reading to you from, she has um, recently been taken from the ghetto with her father and her best friend Daria to Auschwitz. So this is Minka. Daria and I lived in a barracks with 400 other women. The smells were indescribable, unwashed bodies, sweat, festering sores, rotting teeth, and always in the air around us the sweet, charred, sickly scent of flesh burning. At night, the sleeping quarters were so tight, I could feel the hip bones of the woman behind me, twin daggers in the small of my back. When one of us rolled over in our sleep, the rest of us had to do the same. I had spent the week trying to get word of my father. Was he in a different part of the camp, working like I was? Was he wondering if I was alive too? I thought of him every morning as I was marched to work, past the shacks that were the men's barracks, and past the incessant operation of the crematoria. Daria and I were lucky because we had been assigned to Canada. It was an area where the belongings that had come in on the trains were sorted. The valuables were tallied and given to the guards, who brought them to the SS officer in charge of getting them to Berlin. The clothing went somewhere else, and then there were the items no one needed. Eyeglasses, prosthetic limbs, photographs. These were to be destroyed. The reason it was nicknamed Canada was because we imagined that country as the land of plenty. In Canada, if a guard was looking the other way, it was possible to steal an extra pair of gloves, underwear, a hat. The SS officer who was in charge of Canada also spent a portion of the day weaving among us to make sure we did not steal. He was a slight man, not much taller than I was. I had seen him drag outside a prisoner who had hidden a gold candlestick up the sleeve of her jacket. Although we did not see the beating, we could hear it. The prisoner was left unconscious in front of the barracks. The officer returned to walk through the aisles where we worked with a nauseated look on his face. It made him seem human, and if he was human, how could he do this to us? Secretly, when he passed by, I thought of him as Herr Dibbick, a human man too weak to force out the evil that had taken up residence in him. There was always a little ripple of awareness when Herr Dibbick arrived or departed, as if his presence was an electric shock. Even though I did not turn around to watch, I could hear him approaching with another SS officer. They were speaking, and I eavesdropped on their German conversation as I ripped open a hem. So then, the beer hall? At eight. You won't tell me you're too busy again. I'm beginning to think you're avoiding your own brother. Over my shoulder, I peeked. I'll be there, Herr Dibbick vowed. He was talking to the SS officer who oversaw Appel, the man in charge of the women's camp, the one with a tremor in his hand, the one who was not inhabited by an evil spirit. He was just evil, period. He ran hot and cold when it came to overseeing Appel. Either he seemed bored and the count went quickly, or he was on a rampage and took his fury out on us. Just that morning, he had raised his pistol and shot a girl who was too weak to stand upright. When the girl beside her jumped in response, he shot her too. These officers were related? The guard who was watching me sift through the suitcases shouted at me to get to work, so I reached into the pile that never seemed to get any smaller and pulled out a leather valise. This one I recognized. Inside were the candlesticks that had come from my grandmother, wrapped carefully in my father's tallis. Beneath that were his socks, his undershorts, a sweater my mother had knit for him. 
He told me once that he hated it, that the sleeves were too long and the wool too itchy, but she had gone to so much trouble, how could he not pretend that he loved it more than anything? I could not catch my breath. I had not believed my father was truly dead until I opened this suitcase. With shaking hands, I lifted the sweater. This sleeve was the one my mother had been working on when my sister fell down and hit her head on the corner of the piano bench and needed stitches. This hemline she had measured against my father's midsection, joking out loud she had not meant to marry such a gorilla of a man. Wiping my eyes, I started to pull the hem of the sweater. I rolled the yarn up around my arm like a bandage, a tourniquet for a soul that was bleeding out. The guard closest to me approached, screaming, jerking his gun at my face. Do it, I thought. I kept pulling on the yarn until it lay in a nest around me. Somewhere Daria was watching, too afraid for her own welfare to tell me to stop, but I couldn't. I was unraveling too. The commotion attracted some of the other guards. When one leaned down to grab the candlesticks, I snatched them in one hand and took the scissors I had used to cut up fur coats, pressing the blade against my throat. The guard laughed. The SS officer in charge of Canada pushed through the crowd. Vem gehört dieser Koffer? To whom does this suitcase belong? Meinem Vater, I murmured. He looked at me for a long moment, then turned to the other guards and shouted at them to stop staring. Get back to work, he said, and a moment later, he was gone. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome, and thank you for that. Sure, just a little light reading to start us off. <laughs> You've never been shy about taking on controversial subjects, and you took on the Holocaust here. What led you, and you've called this story a story of good and evil. Yeah. So what led you to write this book? I was thinking um, about a book I'd read many years ago, which was The Sunflower by Simon Wiesenthal. And in it, Wiesenthal recounts being a concentration camp prisoner and being brought to the bedside of a dying Nazi soldier who wanted to confess to a Jew, any Jew would do, what he had done wrong in the hopes that he could be absolved and then die in peace. And in the course of the book, Wiesenthal comes to realize that he can't forgive this man. Even if he wanted to, it is not his place to do so. The only people who can forgive him are those upon whom the sins were perpetrated and they're dead. So basically, this Nazi is out of luck. But, you know, it, in the years since it's been published, it has been republished with epilogues and commentaries added to it by politicians and theologians and philosophers, all weighing in on what Wiesenthal came to see, whether they think he was right, and what their own traditions would urge them to do. And, um, you know, it kind of got me thinking. Could a person do something really awful and then spend the rest of their life trying to make up for it and ever erase that stain on their soul. And by the same token, if you consider yourself a morally good person, is there any one thing that could make you tip the balance and commit an act that most of us would think is pretty heinous, like killing someone? And could I possibly take Wiesenthal's scenario and update it for the modern generation in a way that would make us remember why 70 years after the Holocaust, it was still really important to keep telling the story? Right. You have a... A reputation for being very thorough in your research. Yeah. And you've got some really interesting stories to that end. I but do. How did you research this book? Well, I actually started um, in an unlikely place. I started with my mother. My mother should work for the government because um, literally after I called her and asked her to maybe find me some Holocaust survivors in Scottsdale where she lives part time, it took her half an hour and she had a list of nine names for me. It was really scary. <laughs> but she, um, she basically gave me the names of nine survivors who I contacted. Some of them I wound up speaking to. Some of them, it was too hard for them to tell me their stories. Uh, I can share with you some of their stories because to me, they're truly amazing. They really are the heroes of this book. Um, all of those real life experiences cut and braided together formed Minka. So everything that happens to Minka happened to someone I spoke to. And uh, there's a man, for example, whose name is Bernie. Bernie grew up in a small town in Poland with 5,000 Jews in it. By the end of the war, there were only 36 Jews left. Um, he told me a story of how when the Germans occupied the town, they would hide in their basement. And um, they could hear the Germans walking around upstairs. And one night, a family friend was there with the baby, and the baby started crying. So they started to feed the baby little bits of bread to keep him quiet. 
but he wouldn't shut up. So mom was juggling the baby and pressing its face against her, her shoulder, and she accidentally smothered the infant. She wound up going upstairs, sitting on the curb, and just waiting for three days until the next roundup because she didn't want to be alive anymore. When the Germans finally did come for him, he was grabbing onto the doorframe of his house so hard that he peeled the mezuzah off it. If you don't know what that is, it's a little metal strip that is nailed to a door that has a scroll in it, which has been blessed. And he held this mezuzah in his hand for the entire war like this, with three fingers curled down, to the point where when the war ended and he was liberated, his hand had fused this way and he had to have it surgically opened. But when I met with him, he showed me that mezuzah that he had carried all that time. Um, there was another survivor by the name of Gerda Weissman Klein, very famous as survivors go. She was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Obama. And she uh, was taken from her home again in Poland in 1942. Her parents were sent to Auschwitz and killed. She was sent to a variety of work camps. One of, uh, after f several years of being in these work camps, when the Allies advanced, they began to shut them down, and she was put on a forced march of 350 miles in the dead of winter in January 1945 with 4,000 other women. Only 150 survived. Um, she said the reason she survived is because when she was taken from her home in June, her father said, Gerda, wear your ski boots, and she did. And she had those boots on the march. Uh, her best friend, Ilse, died in her arms during the march, and at the end of it, when she was liberated by the Allies, it was American soldiers, um, she weighed 68 pounds, her hair was white, she had not bathed or showered in three years, and uh, a man opened the door for her, held the door open, and uh, it was a soldier, and she was shocked, and she said, I I'm a Jew, you know, and he said, I am too, and they wound up getting married. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? It's a great story. Yeah. Uh, we've all seen documentaries, we've read books, we've seen movies. But you really got close to this yeah. subject. What, what surprised you most about the, the plight of, of victims in the Holocaust? I think what surprised me the most was not the resilience. Um, you know, like the, another survivor, the one probably I grew closest to was a woman named Manya. I stayed with her when we were doing our interviews. And when I went back home, she uh, would kept writing me emails saying, are you done writing the book? I'm an old woman. You know I'm going to die soon. <laughs> so, um, she's still alive. You'll be happy to know. I just saw her. But um, Manya had another remarkable story that was, uh, I stole a lot from her life, from Minka. She also, like Minka, is fluent in German because she went to a Catholic high school, which was the only place that she could get in as a Jew, ironically. Uh, she had someone secure her a place there. And um, she had to study either French there, which was taught by a large, ugly nun, or German, which was taught by a young, attractive male teacher, and so she took German. Um, she became his star pupil. And because of that, she was routinely placed in secretarial jobs through the war instead of hard labor. And many times, she showed pluck. Um, there was one time, for example, that her father was in a camp with her and was dying because he was sentenced to hard labor. So she took an empty file folder, closed it up, marched her way to the commandant's office saying, I am under strict orders to not show anyone the contents of this folder but the commandant, in fluent German. She gets to the guy's office, he opens it up, he sees an empty file, and he just looks at her. And um, this guy had hanged someone the week before for trying to escape, not a nice guy. And she said, I don't know if you have a daughter, but if you do, I hope she would do for you what I need to do for my father. And she explained how he was dying because he wasn't strong enough to work in this job. And the man listened to her, and the commandant wrote something down and changed her father's position. So he did wind up surviving that camp. He unfortunately was killed at Auschwitz not long after oh, that. Man. But um, she had a lot, of, a lot of fervor, a lot of pluck. And I saw that in all the survivors, but I expected that because they didn't give up. What shocked me the most was who they had come to be. Hmm. Because here are these men and women in their 90s, and what do they want to talk to me about? Gay rights. <laughs> because in their mind, that is another example in our country currently of inequity yeah. and of discrimination. And that is what they believe in. They believe that when you start to see little forms of prejudice and little forms of discrimination like that, it can blossom out of control. And that amazed me and inspired me. Your books are often about, well, they're all about moral dilemmas. And yet you grew up in, in your words, uh, disgust, disgustingly happy, happy in, yeah. <laughs> in Long Island. Um, so how does a girl with a great childhood you know, look into these dark and controversial subjects? What leads you to that? I honestly think I would not write what I write if I were living the lives of my characters. If you've read my books, perhaps you've, you've noticed they all have miserable lives, all these characters. Well, talk and about <laughs> some of the moral dilemmas, if you would. Just talk, talk, sure. give a litany of the, 
the kinds of moral um, dilemmas that okay, you're... Okay, so, um, you know, there's... Uh, there's a question about stem cell research in one of them. There's another one about wrongful birth suits. Um, another one about a school shooting in America uh, and bullying. Um, there's another one about gay rights. Teenage suicide. Teenage suicide. Right, yeah, right. I mean, I, I've written you take on the, You take on the little issues is what yeah, you do. Yeah, no. um, But, you know, I, I haven't lived those things. I've been very fortunate. I have a terrific home. I have a great husband. I have three happy, healthy kids. And uh, I think if I were living that every day, I would find it very hard to go to my office and write about it. I think it's because I have a giant safety net that I can kind of walk on the dark side because every day I get to go downstairs at the end of the day and I'm not living the lives of my characters. How do you become those characters given your frame of mind, given your experience, not having had to deal with these situations? Exactly the way I did it for the storyteller. Mm -hmm. I find people who have had that experience and I sit down with them, I shadow them, I spend time with them, I listen to their stories. Um, it, it's weird, especially to make this reference with the storyteller, but you know, there's that old adage about the sin eaters, the Catholic priests who would take on the sins of those who were dying and hold them inside themselves. Mm. And that's sometimes what it feels like to be a writer. You take in all the pain and suffering of the people who are spilling their stories to you for research, and you just hold it inside of you for a little while and then squeeze it out on a page. Mm. So how do you arrive at these subjects? How do you decide, well, this book's going to be about gay rights, or this one's going to be about stem cell research? I think the subjects choose me. Um, there are usually things that I am worried about as a mom, as a woman, as an American. They're the things that keep me up at night, and if they keep me up for several nights, it's probably an excellent idea for a book. That's really how it works. <laughs> Has there been any subject that you've been reluctant to take on that you might choose to... There have been subjects that I don't want to write right now that become more attractive to me as my life changes because even though I haven't lived these experiences, they somehow begin to cross you know, my consciousness in different ways as I grow older or as my kids grow older. Um, you know, One thing that I'm asked to write about a lot actually is the military, which is interesting because I don't have a, a lot of personal experience with the military. Mm. God knows there's plenty of controversial issues in the military, but... I can't say I wouldn't write about it, but it's not at the forefront of my consciousness right, right now. Right. I've been asked to write a lot about race in America, and I have actually just found the story to do that with. Hmm. And I'm very excited about that. It'll come out in a few years. Good. The, the, it's, it's clear that you develop a relationship with your characters because they're very sympathetic. D despite what moral dilemma they're wrestling with, they become sympathetic. Mm -hmm. um, so, so several of your books have been adapted into movies. <laughs> including uh, uh, My Sister's Keeper in yes. 2009 with Cameron Diaz. H how does it feel to relinquish your work and put it in the hands of a filmmaker to make his or her own interpretation of it? What is, what is that like? Um, it's kind of like having a root canal done with, <laughs> you know, with a grapefruit spoon. That's what it's like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the experience of My Sister's Keeper was not a pleasant one. Right. Um, I have had some great TV adaptations done of my work, and I've had a lot of input into them, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of really good directors who have adapted that material. Unfortunately, Nick Cassavetes was not among those. Um, <clears throat> I was actually asked to talk to him before he was hired. And, of course, what most people don't realize is that the author of the novel has zero control over the film, zero control. Um, unless maybe you're J.K. Rowling, you know, but uh, I'm not. And um, anyway, I, I was asked to talk to him because it was very important to me that the ending of that book stayed the same in the movie. Um, and I, I said to him, that's what sold millions of copies of this book. You know, people who say, I can't tell you what happens, just could you read it so we could talk about it? And it, it's really, it's what really made that book, I think, a, a grassroots movement all its own. So he read the book, and he said, you're right, that is the only ending for this story. I'm not going to change it. If anyone does, I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to tell you myself. I thought, that's totally fair. And he spent a year writing a script, calling me weekly, asking for my help, asking me if I could read sections for him. And the script looked a lot like the book and had the right ending. And then one day I got an email from a fan who worked at a casting agency. And she said, did you know they changed the ending of My Sister's Keeper? So I called Nick at home, and he wouldn't take my phone call. So I flew to the movie set, and he threw me off the set. 
So I marched to Toby Emmerich's office at New Line Cinema, and I said, you're going to lose money on this film. He's the head of New Line Cinema. And he went, no, 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 we know what we're doing. We really trust Nick. And I said, you're going to lose money on this film. And sure enough, lo and behold, they lost money on the film because <laughs> you guys are the best fans ever. <laughs> and... Um, you know, it was great because ironically, as a result of that, no matter how heartbreaking it was at the time, and it really was, it was almost making me physically ill during the process, I now have this weird clout in Hollywood because I very psychically predicted a loss of money, and I was right. <laughs> Has there been a film ad adaptation of your work that you like? Um, yeah, there have been several, actually, that I like, uh, you know. Let me, let me just say, this is the most gracious guest we've ever had. She not only poured herself water, <laughs> she poured me water. Sorry. That is unbelievable. <laughs> we never had that before. Gorbachev <laughs> never poured me water. <laughs> it's just the worst. Was, who does he think he is, anyway? <laughs> um, you know, I, I really enjoyed the adaptation that was done of The Tenth Circle and of Salem Falls, which were TV movies. In fact, Salem Falls came out after My Sister's Keeper, and the people who were doing the movie were living in absolute terror of me because they knew how crazy <laughs> I went after My Sister's Keeper. And they did change the ending. And I looked at the script. I said, you guys, no. And they changed it back, which was great. So I felt really good about that because they did listen to me. Um, there is currently a script of Change of Heart that is a beautiful script mm -hmm. that was co-written by me and another very talented filmmaker. That's the reason it's beautiful, not me. And um, it is a very faithful adaptation of the book. It is uh, being shopped around by a, an independent producer who really wants to go the festival route mm. because uh, she thinks she'll have more control over the film. And I would certainly hope that that, that would happen. So I hear your friends with Robert Redford. Feel free to call him up. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I just think I'd like to see that happen because it would be a very honest adaptation. And that's, that's an important book. It's about the death penalty in America. It's a good one to talk about in this state. And, um, you know, and, and I think, uh, I think it, would, it would be very well made. So one of the more interesting parts of your resume involves Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah. You did five uh, episodes, five, five uh, comic, it, books. comic books for, for, for the DC Comics. Yeah. Wonder Woman. What led you to do that? I wrote a book called The Tenth Circle. And the main character in The Tenth Circle was not a very communicative guy. His daughter is date raped at, as a, a young teen. And he can't tell you as a reader how he's feeling, but he can show you because he's a graphic novelist. And so he creates this graphic novel in The Tenth Circle that is an allegory for what he feels in the aftermath of this trauma with his daughter. And um, I actually wrote that graphic novel. I hired an artist to create the art for it. It was embedded in the text. And someone at DC Comics read it. So they wrote me an email and they said, hey, would you be interested in writing some issues of Wonder Woman? And I was like, oh, gee, you know, that's really nice, but I don't have time to do that. And I went down to dinner that night and I was telling my kids and they all looked at me and said, mom, you totally have to write Wonder Woman. <laughs> so I juggled everything around and, uh, and I did. I wrote uh, five issues, which were then bound together in a book. And I'm really proud of them. It was hard to do. It's the only character I haven't created. You know, she's been around since 1941, and I had to be very true to everything that had come before me because there were lots of fanboys still living in their mom's basements who wanted to tell me what I got wrong. And, um, and yet I still had to be able to put my stamp on her somehow. So I was thinking, well, why would they have asked me to write this? And, and I will say I was only the second woman to write Wonder Woman since her conception in 1941, which is kind of ridiculous. The first thing I tried to do was to get her straps on her bustier because... <laughs> You're not going to fight crime unless you have straps. <laughs> it didn't happen. They would not change it. But I will point out that after I stopped writing, they gave her a jacket at least. So I'm really happy about that. Um, but, you know, I, I thought, well, to be able to do something that would, that would honor the way I tell stories, you know, and yet still allow her to, to continue to grow, um, I basically realized she's kind of like Superman and that she can do no wrong. And she loves humans, but she's not a human. And I thought it would be very fun to see her in a capacity of trying to act human, you know, but not know how to order a coffee at a Starbucks or how to pump gas because she just doesn't get that. She's an Amazon princess. And, uh, and then I thought, well, what do all women have that she hasn't had yet? And I thought issues with their mother. So that's what I did. I created a big war where her mother was basically taking the Washington Monument and throwing it at her. And, um, and that was really fun. That's the Jody Picot stamp that's on Wonder Woman. That's the stamp, yeah, on Wonder Woman. Yep. And you put yourself in as an Amazon warrior. I did. I was, I was kicking Batman's butt. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you have been uh, very outspoken in your criticism of the press and how they treat your male counterparts versus women novelists. That's correct. Talk a little bit about what leads to your feelings uh, about the disparity. Well, it's, it's actually not feelings, it's facts. Uh, the truth is that there is an inequity in publishing that currently male writers are reviewed more often, more frequently, and by more male reviewers than, than female reviewers at various media outlets from um, you know, the Atlantic to all the way to the New York Times. And there's a group called Vita, which has actually been crunching those statistics for several years now and, and showed it. You can see it if you look it up on pie charts um, and see, you know, for example, the New York Times has two thirds of, of the reviews that it offers are for men versus one third for women. Now, that's a particularly interesting t statistic given that readers are over 60 percent women. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a real inequity there. Uh, that gets even muddier when you begin to look at the difference between genre fiction writers and literary writers. Uh, it's very rare for a genre fiction writer to be treated as anything important. And yet you will see, for example, um, Stephen King, who I love, mm -hmm. um, he's a great writer, being reviewed in the New York Times. You will not necessarily see a female genre writer of that caliber, say a romance writer, being reviewed. Um, that's not fair. It's just not right. And so one of the really nice things about having, um, you know, I guess an, an invisible podium as a writer who has readers and who has people looking for what she says is to be able to sometimes say things that get people thinking and get people to notice inequities. And um, it all started when Jonathan Franzen was reviewed for the third time in one week in the New York Times. Directions. Yeah. And, um, and I was like, you know, He's a good writer, but really? I mean, isn't there anything else we can write about here? And I, I honestly, I must have sent some little tweet about that, and it must have been a very slow media day because everybody jumped on it. And um, I was not saying anything about Franzen. I, you know, I've read his stuff. He's a very good writer. I was actually making a comment about the fact that this reviewer, this review outlet, did not choose instead to pick what I would say would be this you know, the best review it could have, which would have been a woman of color who writes genre fiction. That would have mm -hmm. been great. You know, but instead, no, it was the third story on Jonathan Franzen. What was really interesting was that in the big brouhaha that happened after that, Jonathan Franzen himself said, yeah, she's right. I mean, he knows what the statistics are, and, and he was very fair about it. Um, I'm not making this stuff up, but it is, it's still dispiriting to know that three years after I started talking about it, and Jennifer Weiner has also been very outspoken, she is a, a genre fiction writer, um, not much has changed. Mm. You know, they actually just released the numbers for last year, about a week ago, and according to the Vita statistics, only one review outlet, Tin House, has actually evened out the balance because they went and, and actively tried to do so. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's fair. I wish that the books that were being reviewed were more representative of the books that people read and of the buyers who buy them. And that doesn't just mean women, it means genre fiction as well. So your genre, you think, is, is largely trivialized? Anyone who writes commercial fiction yeah. is trivialized. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you right now, I'm going to be psychic again. You know, I'm not going to win the National Book Award. I'm not going to win the Pulitzer. You know, because I chose to write commercial fiction. And I did that very intentionally. I did it because I wanted to reach as many people as possible. And commercial fiction runs are much wider and the marketing behind them is much bigger. And I knew I was going to write the same kind of book every time, no matter what. I was still going to give it my all. I was going to do a ton of research. I was going right. to try to educate my readers. So to me, it didn't really matter what label you slapped on it. Right. You know, um, I think it's, it's uh, when you say something is commercial or literary, I think that's self-serving. I think, honestly, if you look at what Jonathan Franzen writes, it's really about the relationships between men and women and how you go about surviving today in America. Right. Um, I would argue that there are lots of women doing the same thing, and they call it chiclet. Right. So, uh, this might be an obvious answer. Why do you take exception to that term, chiclet? Oh, I don't take exception to it. Chiclet's a great genre. Lots of people read it. It tends to be funnier than what I tend to write. I mean, someone once said, you know, well, do you worry about the storyteller being chiclet? And I said, wow, if they think the storyteller's <laughs> chiclet, they're really misreading that book. I mean, there's nothing <laughs> funny in that. <coughs> um, you know, chiclet is, it's just a genre, and it's, um, it, it's usually 
about younger women. It's usually got a lot of humor in it, um, like just like thriller is a genre or mm -hmm. mystery is a genre. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you could say that I write a genre if you want to call it, I don't know, morality fiction or mm -hmm. something. I may be the only person in the genre, but, um, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, but it definitely is commercial fiction. I am trying right. to educate and entertain you, not just navel gaze. But you've also pointed out that there's a lot of commercial fiction by female authors that, have, that has really stood the test of time. Talk, talk a little bit Absolutely. about that. I mean, you know, look at what today's classics are, are very often yesterday's commercial fiction. Right. You know, Charles Dickens wrote for the masses. William Shakespeare wrote for the masses. Jane Austen wrote for the masses. Gone with the wind. Uh, yeah, the, all of this masses, stuff right. that we consider a classic was not the esoteric literature back then. It was really stuff that was for public consumption, for fun, for readership. So are you going to tell me that J.K. Rowling is not going to be a classic 100 years from now? Of course she is. You are both a commercial success and you're incredibly prolific. Um, talk, so something's clearly working. Uh, <laughs> talk about your writing process. Sure. And I have to tell you, that's something that works against you. You know, there is this, this sort of unspoken belief that if you produce a book a year, it can't possibly be good. And then because it's formulaic in some respects. Right. Don't even get me started on that word, I mean, really. Fair enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, drives me crazy, yeah. When I hear, you know, oh, the storyteller's so formulaic, I think, really, how many historical fiction Holocaust vampire novels have you read? You know, because I, I just don't think it's, it doesn't feel formulaic to me, but I don't know. I think formulaic means commercial to a lot of reviewers. Um, I would argue everyone has a formula. I'm going to tell you Jane Austen had a pretty good one. It worked really well. Um, you know, and I would argue that even Mr. Franzen has a formula. Uh, you know, anyone who finds readers has a formula. So um, I, I hate that term, but that's not your fault. Right. But uh, <laughs> um, my routine is very regimented, and I think that's how I do it. Um, I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Usually I go for a three-mile walk with a friend of mine. We gossip the whole way. I come back, help my daughter get off to school, and at 7.30 I'm at my desk, and I'm reading emails. I get about 200 fan emails a day, and I read and answer every one. I do not have a secretary. I have nobody who works for me. Um, so I, I really feel it's important to do that. There are a lot of books in the world. You picked mine. I think it's good breeding to say thank you. And um, then I pull up whatever I was working on the day before. I edit my way through it. When I get to the bottom, I just keep writing. And I go in, until about 3.30 when I very magically become a mother again. Hmm. Do yeah. you get blocked ever? No, and I'll tell you why. Writer's block is for people who have too much time on their hands. Okay? So all of you in the audience, That's right. Right, listen to this. How many of you remember being in college and you couldn't get that paper done because you had writer's block? Did it not miraculously clear the night before the paper was due? <laughs> right? That's true. So when I started writing, you know, I, I had a newborn. Um, I had written my first book. My, my first son was born. Then I had his brother, and then I had his sister. I had three kids under the age of four, and I was writing a book a year, and I was the primary caretaker. I didn't have a lot of time to write. I was writing when Barney was on television. I was taking my laptop and putting it on the steering wheel and typing, waiting for nursery school pickup. Mm. Um, I was writing at swim practice. I was writing any time I had 15 minutes. And because of that, I learned to really write on demand. And even now, when I have more time, I still function that way. I sit mm -hmm. down and I just write. There are days I write absolute garbage. Mm. You can always edit something bad, but you can't edit something blank. When you leave, it seems like you, you, you can, it's true. It's true. You can uh, take a clean break from your work and get back to your life. But are those characters still living in your head? Are you still germinating ideas when you're not at the typewriter? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, um, I, uh, at night, a lot of the time, I'll hear them in my head. Uh, I've long said that writing is successful schizophrenia. I get paid to hear voices. Yeah. That's what it is. And they're very clear to me. They're very distinct. And those voices are the first things that come to me for a new book. They're, you know, that's what I feel like I'm channeling and writing down. So I do, I do get ideas, most often when I'm driving. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually take out a pen and I write them on my arm as I'm driving so I can transcribe them when I get home. Well, clearly the stories of people inspire you because you often use them as composites in your own character. Yeah. What writers most inspire you? Well, probably the most inspirational writer for me was Margaret Mitchell, because I read Gone with the Wind when I was 13 years old, and it's the first time I remember thinking, wow, she created a whole world out of words. I could do that. It was like that moment where I thought, oh, I could make a career out of this. And I read the book. I memorized passages. I used to act them out as both Rhett and Scarlet, which is why I didn't have a boyfriend until I was 15. And... Um, <laughs> 
I loved it. And you know, that was really the first moment I remember thinking I could maybe do this. Um, as an adult, as a fan, the first writer who I fell in love with was Alice Hoffman. Hmm. Uh, she is an amazing writer who makes writing look so easy, and it's never easy. So that has always fascinated me. One of the high points of my career was being asked to do a talk with her. And I was like, yes, I'll go to Siberia if you'd like me to, just so I could be in the same room. And I met her, and um, we became friends. And, you know, like, I have her cell phone number and stuff. It's very cool. <laughs> so it's great. But we are good friends now. And, uh, you know, and, and then there are tons of writers whose work I love now, who I, I look for and I get excited about. Um, you know, Alice is one of them. I love Chris Bojalian's work. I love Sue Miller. I love Ann Tyler. Um, you know, I, I just, I love reading stories that I think capture me because the characters really take me away. Has there been a book, and by the way, it, we're, I'll take questions in about uh, two minutes if you all want to start lining up at the, at the microphones. Um, have there, has there been a book... Uh, published in the last several years where you said, God, I wish I had written that. Life of Pi. Mm. Oh, God, was I jealous. Mm. I read that book. First of all, I read the book and I was like, oh, God, that was brilliant, you know? And I mean, the Life of Pi is brilliant because it's really about two things. It's about faith and it's about the power of a story. And, um, and interestingly, I just watched the movie recently and I was all upset because they went with the faith angle and not really the story angle. And, mm. you know, as a writer, I was hoping they'd go the other way. But I read it, and I said to my mother, you have to read this. Just read this book. So she reads the book, and she calls me up. She goes, what the hell is this about? I don't know what this is. It was so funny. And I had to explain the whole thing to her. But it really is about the transformative power of words and, and about stories and how we tell them. Um, and I loved that. And I loved that overarching metaphor. So I, I finished the book, and I just thought, you know, Jan Martel's a genius. I wish I had done that. What's next for you? My next book is currently called The Elephant Graveyard. It could change by tomorrow, but right now it's called The Elephant Graveyard. It's the story of a woman named Alice Metcalf, who is an elephant researcher studying grief and cognition in elephants. Um, you may not know this, but they have very elaborate grieving rituals. Um, an, elephant will, uh, <coughs> an elephant will return to the spot where an elephant has died for many, many years, and their behavior gets very different. They get quiet, serene, retrospective. It's a little like we would at a graveyard. Um, they will, they've been known to break into uh, research facilities that have bones they're doing research on and take them back to the spot where an elephant has died. Um, they, have, uh, they can identify from a bunch of skulls which elephants they knew and which ones they didn't. And you can see a calf go up and put its trunk into the mouth cavity of one particular skull that was its mother, which is how it would have greeted her. It's remarkable to watch. So anyway, Alice is studying all this, and she's studying it at her husband's elephant sanctuary in New England when a tragedy occurs. A, a, a caregiver is trampled by an elephant there. And that same night, Alice Metcalf vanishes off the face of the earth. Hmm. And the only witness is her three-year-old daughter, Jenna, who can remember nothing. The book opens 10 years later when Jenna is 13. She has never believed her mother would leave her willingly, and she decides she is going to find out what happened to her. So she winds up teaming up with a publicly disgraced psychic in the hopes that this woman can find some new evidence that will allow them to go back to the original detective and have the case reopened as a missing persons case, knowing very well that what she finds out about her mother may be stuff she really does not want to hear. Hmm. Uh, so it's a book about loss, it's a book about grief, and how some people survive it and some are crippled by it. And most importantly, it has the best twist that I've written in 20 years. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> We can't hear that without inviting you back. Okay, to, to great, back. fantastic. Come back. Yeah. So you've written, uh, you've obviously, you've written 18 books, 18 novels, you've written uh, comics, you've written a play, you've written a teen book. What uh, would you like to do that you haven't done? What a great question. I don't know if I've ever been asked that. Well, I'm pretty good. That's good, that's really good, Mark. Yeah. I'll tell you what I would love to do that I, I don't know if I could pull it off, and I would certainly need a pretty interesting collaborator, but I have done a lot of work in theater. Um, <clears throat> I've written you know, a variety of children's musicals with my son, and a couple of them have been published so that other schools can put them on. We did it to raise money for local charities, and, and it's been incredibly successful. We raised over $100,000 for local charities in nine years. And um, I would love to take one of my books, 19 Minutes in particular, and turn it into a musical like Rent. <laughs> I think that would be really cool. 
So if there's anyone out there who like knows an amazing rock band that wants to collaborate, <laughs> I am in the city of music, so you know, bring them on up to me. That's I great. think that would be really interesting. That's great. Why don't we take some questions from the audience? Start over here. Hi. <laughs> um, have you ever started researching something and then decided I really don't like this or don't want to do anything about it? Or Not by the time I'm doing my research. Honestly, by the time I do the research, I usually have formed enough of the idea in my head that when I get to the research, I'm so excited to be there, the opposite happens. There's way too much, and I have to sift through it and figure out what I'm going to use in the book and what I'm not going to use. Thank you. Ma'am. One of the things I always um, astounded in your books is that, like in 19 minutes, that you have all the different perspectives, but unlike most authors, you never give away which perspective you think it, it, you, is your perspective, well, which you would you. think in real life. And I wonder how you do that, how you kind of keep yourself out of it, it seems. That's a great question. And honestly, um, it's the nicest compliment you could give me. I once had a man who came up to me at a reading and he said, I have read My Sister's Keeper six times and I still don't know if you're for or against stem cell research. Exactly. <laughs> I was like, yes. Um, you know, I'm really opinionated and I'm always happy to tell you my opinion, but I don't think my opinion should trump yours. I don't think it's my job to tell you what to think. I do think it's my job to tell you every facet of a given controversial situation so that you have the tools and the resources to then reevaluate your own opinion. And maybe you'll change your mind and maybe you won't. But you need all of those different points of view. It is not easy to always espouse different points of view. But writing in multiple narrative voices makes it a little simpler for me. Because even in a book, for example, like Sing You Home, where there is a point of view that's very different from mine, uh, the character of Max there belongs to an evangelical church that is particularly opposed to gay rights. It's something I'm very passionate about because I have a gay son. Um, you know, I, I had a hard time writing him, but he's, his words came verbatim from a six-hour interview I did with Focus on the Family. It is the only interview I've ever done where I had to keep putting the phone down, excusing myself, going into another room and like yelling and then coming back. <laughs> Because I, I just couldn't hear what this woman was saying without you know, getting really angry. When you say to someone, do you worry that some of your rhetoric might lead to hate crimes against gay people? And she says, thank goodness that's never happened. Mm. That's a problem for me. So, but I digress. Anyway, but, you know, but the thing is, I had to give you that point of view. Because it was only fair that you hear what they say and why they say it. So Max provided that for me. And you can't fault Max. He may not believe what you believe or what I believe, but he believes 100% in what he's telling you. And that is what makes his narrative honest and truthful. And that's why you can look at it and say, well, I at least have to give a fair shake to this and hear him out before I make my decision. So by splitting those opinions into multiple narratives, it actually becomes easier to hide my point of view somewhere in, in the range of them. Okay, thank you. Let's go over here. I have question anxiety now. That was so good. <laughs> I'm also a self-employed mother of three kids, and so mine's more about family life balance. When I get clients, my family's tired of hearing about them. How do you manage your family life balance in your job? What's been successful for you? Well, my kids have been very gracious about sharing me. I mean, I think they, they think it's funny, you know, when people recognize me at an airport or something and, and they've come to my events and they roll their eyes because they just don't get what the fans are going all crazy about, you know. Um, <laughs> they also, I mean, there have been moments that have worked for them. I remember once um, my son Jake was, I think he was 12 years old, and he was sharing a high school cafeteria. He was in middle school. And this high school girl came running up to him because he was reading Perfect Match. And uh, she said, oh my gosh, Jody Pico, that's my favorite author. How have you heard of her? And Jake went, that's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, you know, honestly, for me, it is about putting them first. Um, I really have tried to do that. I have... There have been multiple times in my career that I have flown 30 straight hours from a different continent to make it home to the school concert. Uh, I, I'm coming home a day early from uh, a British tour in three weeks so that I can see Jake perform in Avenue Q. And I will always put them first and shuffle my life, including my work life, around them. So they knew that they still came first, even though there were huge swaths of time, you know, three or four weeks at a time that I was gone and that I couldn't really be with them. 
I also have to give enormous credit to my husband. He is a remarkable guy who married me not having any clue that this is what he was signing on for. <laughs> and, um, and really, without him, I couldn't do what I do. I doubt there are many women in the audience who could walk out of their house for a month and not leave a single note, but I can. And that's pretty remarkable. So how did you start? Right? You, you wrote your first novel, you had your first novel published at 25. How yeah. did you start writing? Well, I really was writing in college. I went to Princeton's creative writing program because I wanted to learn how to be a writer. And I studied almost exclusively with Mary Morris, who was mm. a, a tremendous influence on me and my writing. She's the only reason I think I'm here today. Mm. And I you know, graduated, and I didn't become a writer because I really wanted to also pay my rent. And um, I wound up working on Wall Street. I worked as a textbook publishing editor. I taught creative writing at a private school. Uh, I was an ad copywriter. I got a master's at Harvard in education. I taught eighth grade English um, in Concord, Mass. I got married. I got pregnant all in two years. <laughs> I'm a little bit of an overachiever. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah so, but the whole time I was writing, because that's what writers do. Writers can't not write. So that's what I did. I just kept writing. I Honestly, I used to do all my work at the textbook publisher before 10 o'clock, and then I would close the door and pretend I was really busy, and I would write my novel instead. <laughs> and literally, a couple of years ago, I saw my old boss in an airport, and he said, yeah, I knew you were doing that. <laughs> and, um, you know, but I, I was really lucky to be able to sort of shoehorn my dream job with my real jobs. And that whole two-year period, I was also trying to get an agent. I had over 100 rejections from agents. Finally, a woman wrote me and said, I have never represented anyone before, but I think I can represent you. And I went, okay. Um, and 20 years later, she's still my agent. Wow, that's remarkable. Next question. Um, I actually have a two-part question, if that's okay. Um, have you ever heard of Chris Kyle? No. Should okay. I? Um, well, Does that I just... mean we don't have a part B? It, well, yeah, um, he was actually in the military and um, was killed by someone with PTSD. Uh -huh. And I wonder if you were ever thinking about writing about mental disorders. Mm -hmm. That's another thing I get asked about a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, right now, I can tell you it's not in the next three books. I don't know if it will be one day, um, but I have a lot of people who ask me for that. I have a lot of fans who write me every day and say, I really think you should write this story. This is the story of my life. <laughs> and honestly, everyone's got a story. You know, you mm. all have stories. But the reason it's important to you is because it's your story, not my story. And I always encourage people to put it on paper because even if you don't consider yourself a writer, the act of doing that, of taking your thoughts and your memories and just trying to put them down is really therapeutic to begin mm. with. You can always hire someone to cobble it into something <laughs> that's publishable, but it's a really good start to figure out why this is an important story to you. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I haven't heard of that particular instance, but I have heard a lot about people who said, why don't you write about mental illness and bring awareness to it? It certainly is something that should be written about. I don't know if I'll be the one to do it, but it has been brought up to me before. Thank you. Sure. Go over here. Okay, I'm sure you get asked this question all the time, but I've read, I think, every one of your books except for one. So I'm just curious if you have a favorite book or a favorite character. Sure. Um, I actually have a favorite book. It is Second Glance. I like it because it addresses a period of history that very few people know about in America when we were in the business of racial hygiene prior to Hitler. Um, it had the best research I've ever done in my life. I got to go ghost hunting, which was really fun. And it was a hard book to pull off technically. And I really feel like I nailed it. So I'm very proud of that for a lot of reasons. Um, I have various characters that I love. Uh, I still worry about Chris Hart uh, from The Pact. I loved writing Jacob Hunt. He is a, a kid with Asperger's, and his narrator, his narration was so much fun to slip into. It was really, really fun to write like him. I get asked a lot about the character that I most often like, and it is not a flattering one. Um, it's actually Nina Frost, I think, from Perfect Match. Nina is a woman who shoots the man who she thinks has sexually abused her son, only to realize she shot the wrong guy. So she basically does all the wrong things for all the right reasons. I can't tell you I would do that, but I can tell you I'd probably think about it. And if you ever crossed one of my kids, I would absolutely come after you. So I think about her a lot. Well, we talked about the research that you do. What was the most interesting uh, research project you had out of one of your books? Well, definitely there were a few. Um, there were a few that were devastating and interesting. Um, certainly doing research on death row. 
mm. was pretty remarkable. I got to see literally behind the curtain, which not a lot of people get to see. And you're still in touch. Not with, anymore because oh, not, he's, he's died. He, he's been he, killed. He was killed, okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I for many years wrote to this one inmate who I had done interviews with um, after I went to this facility in Arizona and I was taken through the facility. And um, it was very interesting. I, uh, I basically was, I was there and they canceled my visit as I was flying to Arizona. And they told me I was the wrong kind of media. So I was literally banging on the door of the prison, begging to be let in, which doesn't happen often. And they did let me in. And uh, they took me on a tour of death row, which honestly, if it's working correctly, should look pretty boring. Most of these guys are stripped down to their underwear because it's hot and they're usually asleep during the day. Um, and I said to one of the guards, could I see the death house? And so he took me to the death house. And of course, every state that has the death penalty has two forms of execution. Uh, in Arizona, it is lethal injection and an electric chair. And so I was in this uh, room where they have the electric chair and I was playing with a switch on the wall when a woman showed up and said, what are you doing? And she was the warden. And um, she asked what I was doing there. And I told her and uh, I said, maybe you can answer some questions for me. And <clears throat> I asked her, um, you know, if she had ever presided over any executions, and she said yes. And then I said, have you ever attended an execution that you were not presiding over? And she said, that's a personal question. And I went, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and she told me about a woman who is, I think she's still on death row in Arizona. She was um, convicted of telling her four-year-old son that they were going to visit Santa, and he put on his Halloween costume. He was all excited. She drove him to the middle of the desert, and four guys that she had hired to kill him for insurance money came and killed the little boy. So she was convicted of this. And this woman, um, has her family no longer speaks to her. And so the warden started to talk to her. And she asked the warden if the warden would attend her execution. And the warden finally said um, yes, not because she thinks that she is innocent, but because she is a, uh, a Christian, a Catholic. And I said, you're Catholic? Do you believe in the death penalty? And she looked at me, and she looked at her assistant, and she asked him to go get a binder on her desk. And it was the statute of how they do this in, ex in Arizona, how they execute someone in Arizona, which is not public information, which inmates routinely sue for and are not given. And she then spent the next six hours reading to me from this binder, uh, exactly how executions happen in Arizona. And <clears throat> I literally was spread out on the death gurney writing as she was telling me all this. And um, she was telling me things like, for example, uh, the way it works is this. There are, uh, they bring the inmate down, and he is, is uh, secured to a gurney, and his arms are out. And there's a doctor there, and the doctor puts in you know, an IV line. And uh, if you can't get it in here, you can get it um, between the toes, because some intravenous drug users have, users have blown out their veins. And uh, what, what happens is there are three, there, there's a tube that goes from the line behind a curtain. And... <clears throat> that, cur that line splits. Part of it is connected to where the doctor's standing with sodium pentothal, and part of it splits off into three again, and there are three guards who have volunteered for this duty who each have a syringe, and um, the syringe has the, uh, the drug that's going to, to kill them. One of them has the syringe. The other two have placebos, and no one knows who's got what. And what happens is the curtains open up in front of the gallery, and the uh, warden comes out, and she reads the death warrant. The death warrant is a one-page document. And then she says um, to the inmate, do you have any last words? Okay, that is the cue for the physician to begin to administer the sodium pentothal, okay? An inmate's last words are usually anything from I love you, mom, to screw the world, or, but it's, it's usually really short. It's not like these guys go on and on for five or 10 minutes. As soon as he finishes talking, the warden says, may God have mercy on your soul, and she walks out. That is the cue for those three guards behind the curtain to push down on their syringes. And what that actually means is biologically there's not enough time for the sodium pentothal to anesthetize that inmate before he feels the potassium chloride in his veins, which is why the Supreme Court, of course, took up this case and ruled and said, no, it is still constitutional. I don't know that I would necessarily agree with that. Um, it was pretty interesting. What I will tell you is that uh, very unexpectedly, less than a month after I did my interview, my surprise interview with her, she quit. And I like to think maybe that was because of me. <laughs> Talk about the correspondence that you maintained with yeah. the inmate for so long. <clears throat> so Robert Towery was a man 
when they canceled my visit, they actually canceled my interview with him, and I had to fly back and do it a different time. Robert was a man who um, was convicted of uh, armed robbery. He, uh, he broke into someone's house. He was taking their stuff, but he told this guy, he tied him up, and he said he was going to anesthetize the guy so that he could be knocked out and couldn't identify him. But he was high as a kite at the time, and he wound up shooting the guy up with battery acid and killing him. Now, he was clean and sober for over 13 years when I met him, and he knows that he did something wrong. He understands that he should have been convicted. He um, has apologized to the victim's family and had some kind of restorative justice with them, um, and he also had multiple appeals that you know, went nowhere. And uh, Robert and I began this correspondence, and it was years. I mean, we actually corresponded for many years. He was a very accomplished artist, and you don't get art materials on death row in Arizona, so he would have to make his pigments. So he um, showed me how you could scrape away a magazine, uh, the black of a magazine, and dilute it in water to get black ink. And um, he saved all the envelopes that he ever got, and he opened them up to use the backs as paper. Um, coffee makes like a, a flesh stain, you know, color. Uh, you know, he would pee, he would um, use water and uh, brush off the coating on M and M's for different pigments. Um, that was how he created his art. And he used to send me these beautiful paintings that he made, um, and his Christmas cards were phenomenal. And uh, he, we had a terrific correspondence. We used to talk a lot about uh, the plot of Grey's Anatomy because he watched a lot of TV. <laughs> and when I was on book tour, he kept me updated. It was great. Um, <laughs> And we did this for several years. He invited me to his execution. Uh, I was unable to go. I was actually on book tour. He completely understood. And he, um, he, it was very interesting because I, was, I know exactly where I was. I was talking about it not too long ago. I was in Seattle doing an event, and someone asked about change of heart. And I said, thank you for bringing this up because I'd like to talk about a friend of mine. And I talked about Robert, and he had been executed that day. And... Uh, Robert had a son who he had recently reconnected with while he was in prison, uh, and he came to me for advice because his son, who had been raised by Mormons, was gay, and he didn't know how to interact with him. And he said, I know your son is gay, and you've been such a good mom. Can you tell me what to do? And I would write him as much advice as I could, you know, and just say, love him, be accepting, be tolerant. Anyway, I came home from that Seattle event. It was almost exactly a year ago, and there was an email waiting for me, and it was from Robert's son. And he said, my dad said you were a very good friend to him, and I was hoping maybe you could be a friend of mine. And Corey and I not only struck up a friendship, but Corey moved to the University of Connecticut to do his graduate work. And my son, um, my oldest son, the, the gay one, is at Yale. And they have met many times, gone out with their partners. They've all gone out to New York City and had a great time. And Corey and Kyle go out to lunch. And I really feel good about that. I feel like maybe Robert knows that his son's, you know, got a buddy out here in the world. Yeah. We have time for two more. Why don't we go over here? Well, after that, I have question anxiety, too. <laughs> I guess my question is also two-part. Um, myself, and I'm sure many people in the audience, have uh, self-published to Kindle, and, and that revolution that's really happening with, in the traditional publishing industry, to what extent do you feel like that's going to maybe help balance out some of the discrimination with female writers and that kind of thing? I mean, how does it affect your writing the independent publishing, self-publishing? Okay, you're not going to like the answer to this. Um, I do not advocate self-publishing. I think it's a mistake. I think that there is currently a stigma against being self-published. If you are self-published, it's very hard to get an, a book contract after that with a traditional publisher. Here's what you lose when you're self-published. You, you lose the heft and the muscle of a publishing company that can get you placement in stores, that can get you marketing, advertising, PR, anything that will get your book out there. Everyone thinks of the brass ring as that published entity. But the real brass ring is knowing that people are buying the published entity. And for that, they need to know it's out there. And there are millions of self-published titles on the Kindle nobody will ever know about. If you are willing to become your own, your own publisher, your own marketing machine, your own PR rep, and spend a year traveling around to book clubs and libraries and festivals trying to get the word out about your book, you can buck the system. But that is not feasible for most people who self-publish. And so what happens instead is instead of waiting for an agent to take them on, instead of weathering all of the criticism and all the no's, they say, oh, I'm just going to self-publish. It'll be easier that way. And you know what? Publishers notice that. They say, oh, they gave in. Um, this is how you can tell that self-publishing is not the be-all and end-all yet. Think of the big 
the biggies in self-publishing, the E.L. James of the world, who managed to write something that does sell millions of copies on the Kindle, what do they do? They turn to a traditional publisher for a print publication. Right. And there's a reason for that still. Right. So what, what is happening with uh, ebook sales is different than self-publishing. Ebook sales are becoming predominant in America. Um, my ebook sale rate at this point is about 47% of my total of sales. And that's gone up dramatically in the past three years. And you know, I'm not someone who particularly minds that. Um, I, I have a Kindle. Sometimes I read on my Kindle. Sometimes I read a hardcover. Sometimes I buy two copies of the same book, one that's electronic and one that's a hardcover, just so I can read it in different places. Uh, but I think that um, what, what becomes difficult are the pricing wars that happen mm. and the deep discounts of books. It's very hard for someone to look at this and not say, I'm getting something for my money. But when people see nothing, it's just downloaded, it's a wisp that's downloaded to your electronic device, they don't feel like they're getting something. So why should they pay $15 for that? That's ridiculous. It's a file, what are you paying for? Well, you're paying for intellectual property. And that's really hard for Americans to wrap their heads around. And I do think that that's gonna have to shift a little bit. We're gonna continue to see that shift a little bit um, because people feel like ebooks should be incredibly cheap. But it was just as much work for me to create the ebook as it was for me to create this book. And honestly, what you're talking about, the pulp, the paper, that's the cheapest part of a book. Well, the music has changed the paradigm. Exactly. Some, it, does that give you encouragement for? No. <laughs> no. Actually, the music industry, you know, you can see it. There was a lot that went wrong in the music industry when, when you began sharing right. downloads and stuff. So I think the publishing industry is archaic. They're having trouble catching right. up. But um, they're also, they don't want to make a misstep either. Yeah. Uh, you know, think about, and, and the other thing that's really hard about ebooks is that they are much more easily pirated. And that's a horrible thing. You know, I mean, to think about the revenue that's lost to pirating is, is really scary. Right. And, and I wish that there was more recourse legally against that. There is still not that much. Right. Last question. Hi. Um, I'm in the Texas Creative Program here at UT yeah. Austin doing art direction and copywriting. And so I deal with critique on a daily basis, and this <laughs> is my first semester. Uh, I was just wondering how you take uh, negative critique and... I guess turn it around to fire it back, um, you know, with a positive creative energy to kind of keep you going rather than letting it bring you down. Like, it's just... another great question. And um, I wish I were better at it. Every year I say I'm not going to read reviews, and then every year I do. <laughs> <coughs> and what makes it hard is that um, I actually had a really interesting breakfast the other day with Brad Meltzer, who was a really nice guy. I'd never met him before. And uh, we've been communicating um, electronically, you know, through email and through Twitter. And, and he said, hey, do you want to have breakfast? I live in Miami. I said, yeah, that would be great. And we were talking about negative reviews and nasty reviews. There is, there's a difference. I mean, there are people who professionally review. And some reviewers give really good constructive criticism. And I think any writer who is intelligent knows you're not going to write something that pleases everyone all the time. And it's their job to find things that maybe they find flawed. I think that's totally fair and legitimate. I think there's another problem, though, when someone's entire review is, I hate commercial fiction and you write commercial fiction. I mean, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, and that does happen, too, sometimes with professional reviewers. And uh, <coughs> Janet Maslin, anyone? New York Times? Um, but, you know, <laughs> she hates me. I swear, she hates me. I don't know what I ever did to her. Um, but the things that kill me the most are the reviews that you get now on Amazon that are like one star, and this is why. Mm. I don't like the price of this book. Right. <laughs> or this was my favorite on Goodreads, actually, for the storyteller. Blood, blood, gore, gore, blood. That's all this book was. And I'm thinking, okay, it's about the Holocaust. <laughs> you know, what were you thinking it was going to be? I don't know. Um, so, you know, it, it's funny because you can't, you honestly can't predict what people are going to say, and it's hard not to take it personally. I think if there was anything I could leave readers with, it's this. We may be writers, but we are human. We read those reviews. Mm. And if you're hiding behind your computer and writing something really mean, like, oh, I think she's phoning it in. She doesn't even do her own work anymore, I bet. You know, we read that, and that hurts. I do my own work. I work really hard. I tried really hard to give you a good book. Really sorry it wasn't something you wanted this time around. Maybe next time will be one that you really like. But maybe when you want to criticize me, you could do it in a way that you would want to be criticized. Mm. I think that's a really good lesson for everyone. It's not a bad idea to think in this age of technology, which is so faceless, mm. that it's a good idea to be kind to. That's a great point. Thank you. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs>
Uh, I want to thank Harry Middleton for suggesting that we, not suggesting, for imploring us yes, thank you. to get a writer for this lecture. And I want to uh, thank Jody for being that writer. Thank you so much. Well, this is delightful. Thank, thank, you. thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. You were fantastic. Thank you.